Great, so thank you for attending this webinar. We'll get started. So as, as we said, we're talking about strategies to control or manage insects that are not normally manageable with insecticides. We really could have titled it strategies to manage difficult pests. It's really just difficult insect pests is really what we're talking about. I'll, we're trying to get to the next slide and having, there we go, here it is. All right, so as an overview for this webinar, we're gonna briefly talk about the project that it falls under. And we're going to talk about how to identify your causal agent and why that's important. We're gonna talk about the problem, so describe our difficult insect pests and then have a general approach to manage these difficult insects. And then we have a few sort of case studies, more specific information pulling out that important information on certain pest groups, groups of pests. We can't cover everything, but hopefully you'll get an idea of, of the general approach. And as I had in the blurb, there are no silver bullets. They can be quite difficult. Certain pest species can be quite difficult, but hopefully you'll get something out of this so that you can manage them better. Okay, so this project started this year. It follows on from uh, a couple of other nursery projects and has a slightly different focus. One major change is that all production nurseries receive six free samples per year. That's across Australia. So all states and territories, you do need to fulfill any quarantine requirements. So if movement of plant into state, if you require certain um, if you're in a quarantine area, then for a certain pest or host, that's gonna be difficult. But for everyone else, you can send us samples and we do receive samples from all states and territories um, on, a, on a regular basis. So we'll be updating and creating new fact sheets. We are making those available on the Australian Plant Production Standard, the website, the Nursery Production FMS website. And we'll also have a big component of this project investigating the effect of nursery hygiene on the pest and disease incidents. So this is quite different from previous projects and it's quite exciting. So hopefully um, we'll get some good results. Okay, so we'll get into the webinar proper on how to identify the causal agent. And firstly, why is it important to identify the causal agent? Because we have, you've probably heard, I mean, who's heard taxonomists, pathologists, entomologists go on, you've got to identify it, you've got to identify it. I mean, who's heard that sort of thing? And they, they rabbit on about this and, um, and no one's raising their hand. If, you, if you've heard that sort of thing, raise your hand, because sometimes you can go, yeah, a few people are raising their hands now. Oops, I didn't mean to go forward, here we go. Um, so what, the reason this is important is, well, there's a few reasons. It allows you to link the known habit of that species to what you've observed. This allows you to confirm that you've got the right pest. So let's say you've found an insect and you look online, you have it identified, but it doesn't match the damage that you are seeing in your crop. Maybe it's not the causal agent. So it can be quite helpful. Find out the name, find out a little bit about it, and then you can get confidence that it is the pest. Is it a known host? Is the damage reported consistent with what you're seeing? And then further to that, um, you can, oops, sorry about that. I didn't actually mean to change my mouse is playing funny buggers on me, um, just to excuse me for that. It allows you to gain information on the biology, on the life cycle. So this is things that people have recorded, have reported online or in the scientific literature on what they normally do. When are they active? What management techniques are effective or ineffective? Because the ones that are ineffective are just as important as the ones that are effective, knowing these, these things. 
knowing the host range and susceptible or resistant varieties is critical. Really important. That sort of information can provide a wonderful way of managing your pest. So when you see a problem, it may not be very easy to identify the causal agent. So it's important to go through some steps to identify that problem. So who, who's had a pest, pest, a pest problem or a, a plant problem, a plant health problem, and not been able to identify the pest, whether it be an insect or a disease or a mite or whatever. Just raise your hand if you've had those cases. A few hands are going up. Um, thank you. Uh, so it's really, it can be quite important. And it, as a diagnostician for the lab, it can be quite frustrating when we can't find out what it is. But even when we can't find the causal problem, we can rule out certain problems. So first thing, is there an organism present that you think could be responsible for the damage? And if there is, take a photo. And we'll talk about taking photos in more detail uh, in, in a slide or two. You can send that to a specialist or you can send that to us at Grow Help. And we will do the best we can, given that it is only a photo. Then you can collect the specimens and you can send them off to a lab for identification. Noting that for insect pests, not all labs can identify all pest groups. You have to be a, a specialized taxonomist to identify some groups. And if you don't have that skill, then it can become difficult. All right, so hang, hold on, I'm just gonna back up again. So when we saw these beans come in, understand that not typical nursery samples, we thought broad mites. Again, not an insect, but for the illustration of an example, we thought broad mites, but there was nothing present. So if you just go on damage alone, you can go fall into some problems. So make use of the free service that you've got, and we'll get back to you as quickly as we can. So then this one here, this one was a really interesting sample, it was sent in. We thought, okay, it looks like sort of a wilt pathogen. And the nursery that sent it in thought, again, it was a, a pathogen causing some sort of dieback. Well, it wasn't a pathogen. So just, if you, in, in first thing that comes to mind, what pest would be causing this damage? Just type it in. And um, we'll give you like five seconds. So five, four, three, two, one. Anyone? All right. Well, this is what we found. Who got it right? Raise your hand if you got it right. This is a, a tip boring fly. I found the maggots boring down into the growing tip. And then this is a pupa. And, and unfortunately, we couldn't identify the species, but we did get down to a group. So we do get some unusual problems coming in that are pests and difficult to manage. So how do we identify these things? And first of all, when is it important to identify? Well, the, the taxonomist in me, the entomologist in me sort of goes, always identify it. But really, in reality, probably not as important in certain instances. When the problem is recurrent, it becomes more and more important to have it identified. And when the problem is really significant, when you're getting a large amount of damage, then send in a sample, investigate in the first instance. Sometimes we, we do receive uh, in, excuse me, inquiries from growers that have had a problem for three or five years and it's like, well, how come you didn't do anything before now? Like you've been losing this much stock and you haven't done anything? Wow, okay, well, that boggles my mind, but hopefully after this webinar, you'll have a little bit more skill and uh, knowledge to, to go the extra mile and have things identified. So you got to, hopefully you have, who has a hand lens that they use and to look for insects and mites and things? Uh, got some hands going up. Yes, great. Thank you. 
Um, who has a phone lens attachment? So you can buy these things on eBay or other places online. They can cost like a very small amount of money, two to five dollars for a macro lens. You can get them in times 10, times 20, various different things, sometimes even times 60. I find those ones that are very high magnification not as helpful. They're quite simple. They don't cost a lot. Really useful tools in your pocket. Okay, who has a microscope that they use to look at uh, insects and mites on their leaves? Yes, a few. It's interesting, I'm getting a lot of the same people um, uh, raising their hands, which is great. Hopefully more people after this will, will purchase these tools to identify problems. Because being able to look down the microscope and dissect your plant is valuable for working out where the problem is and to then take next steps. You can also rear out your individuals. Buy a cage, make a cage. I've seen people bring in their makeshift cage, which is literally a soft drink, uh, like a two liter soft drink bottle. They've cut off the bottom. They've managed to make it sit snugly, let's say in their their 125 mil pots or whatever. They've cut a window in the top, glued down some mesh, uh, like fly screen or, or um, a thinner mesh so that there's some aeration and waited for the insects to come out. And it can be helpful to put some thick card or, or pla plastic um, or something to stop the insects from falling into the top of the media and becoming covered and uh, so you can't see it. So it doesn't have to be high tech. You can build these things yourself uh, and that sort of thing is, is quite helpful for working out what is on my plant. Hold on, it's just trying to get to the next slide. Okay, I think we're there. When you're looking down your microscope, observe other signs. Look for the remains of insects, the frass that they leave behind, the cast off skins. These sorts of things can provide clues as to what's been there in the past because sometimes the damage has occurred and they've already gone by the time you are looking at your plant. So you take note of the type of damage that gives you clues as to what you're dealing with, the type of pest, whether there are holes in the woods, russeting damage, um, galls or twisted unusual growth gives you clues as to where to look so um, to find your pest. And you can always email us, talk to us, this is the damage, where do you think we should look, and, and we can provide some advice. So this is touching on what I just said previously. Sometimes you get damage only very late in the piece. And the pest may be at a very late stage or already gone from your plant. So quite a few, if you grow lily pillies that are not resistant to psyllids, you've probably experienced this sort of thing from time to time. The early stages uh, don't cause a huge amount of damage, but as they get bigger, it doesn't take long for the pits to form. Now in this case here, these are not psyllids. These are parasites that have laid their egg inside the psyllids. So if when you are doing your monitoring, it's important to realize that not all of the things that you find will be a pest. Sometimes you also have problems caused by non-pathogenic disorders and there'll be insects present incidentally. So make sure that you leave your thinking caps on and be discriminatory as to what could be damaging and what may not. Once you have a specimen, depending on the type of specimen it is, you can send it off to a lab and they'll use different tools to identify it. So for most groups of immature stages of insects, it can be very difficult to get a species ID. It's only for very specific groups, let's say scarab beetle larvae, uh, where they have very distinctive characters where you can get potentially get a species ID. Most Insects, larvae, or nymphs, you can't, you can get to a group, but not to a species. 
So tools are becoming more available, more readily available to identify them using molecular, molecular techniques. So we extract the DNA, we run a PCR to sequence a particular gene region, we send that DNA off to a third party laboratory where they, where they actually do the sequencing, they send that information back. We compare that to the international databases on gene sequences to see if it matches. Often, sometimes it matches very well and then you get a species ID. Sometimes it doesn't match as well and maybe you'll get a genus or in a worst scenario, a family. In other cases, they simply have not been gene sequences submitted to these databases from the species that you're dealing with. And therefore, we can't make a match. So that is the difficulty. Um, and that is for adults and larvae. Adults are easier to identify with insects. So if you have the option to send in adults, send in an adult or more than one preferably, um, and talk to us as to how many you might need. Okay, so any questions on why it's important to identify a pest or how and how we identify a pest? Oh, can you hear me, Andrew? I can, John. Okay, um, no questions with regards to that as such, but there's a couple of comments um, other issues that growers have had in the past, one which we've dealt with a number of times, and that's snails and slugs. Um, mm. And this, this growers says that they snip them off with cicatures, soak them in water um, for at least a week before burying them, hopefully killing any eggs that um, might be there as well. So, okay. do you want any mention, say anything about snails and slugs that we? Um, experience in the past? Um, uh, to be honest, I haven't dealt with snails and slugs a great deal. <clears throat> uh, so I really want to investigate further. I know there are some baits around, but really, from what I understand, they can be. Hmm. I'd be open to hearing what um, other people have done for snails. In, in the nursery and perhaps we'll come back to that uh, with f further down in the webinar. Yep. Um, and the other, one of the other ones is about uh, Western Plain Thrips treatment. Um, this is mm -hmm. for wild populations in Victoria rather than a nursery. Um, are there any strategies oh. that we know of which would be effective, uh, especially remnant Dianella species? Uh, Dianella. So hold on, plain, plain tree, and plain, a Western plain thrips um, in Dianella species. In Dianella. Okay. I've got that what we'll do is we will um, we'll talk about that as we go through uh, dealing with things that are more like underneath leaves, similar to leaf miners in some ways. Okay, that's uh, great. Okay. Uh, and a couple that have just come in. Uh, problem with leaf beetles um any any monitoring options for leaf beetles okay um, okay excellent well we can slot and, that in and i guess one which um with regards sampling do you have any pest sampling methods um, okay yes they are available we're not going to specifically talk about them but we can point you in the right direction okay great um and i'm looking through uh, myself, okay. Uh, iron powder or Eco Shield is a organic, new organic product for snails and slugs. So, how effective okay. that is, I don't know myself. But um, all right, and, we'll, and we're going to touch. It. It. Yeah, we're going to touch on using new products in the webinar. So, yeah. okay, great. All right, perfect. Okay. All right, well, keeping keep your comments coming. And what we'll do is we'll keep on moving and then um, uh, and touch on these things as we go along. Yeah. All right, so I'm just trying to move to the next slide. Here we are. Okay, so we're gonna summarize our problem now. 
What are these difficult insects? What are these characteristics to describe these difficult things? Oftentimes, they are continuous or recurrent that come into the nursery repeatedly, even after you, you, know, you get rid of it, then they come in, get rid of it, they come in. Insecticides may not seem to manage the pest. Predators don't seem to manage the pest. Low numbers may cause a high damage or just make them appear so unattractive that they're unassailable. The pest may be cryptic. So whether it's like the cutworms someone mentioned uh, in a comment, uh, they're under the ground, you don't necessarily see them. Sometimes they come out at night. Early stages don't, may not produce a lot of damage. Late stages will consume uh, a very large volume or ring bark your plant and then all of a sudden you've got plant death. So then you're dealing with small numbers causing high damage. One thing that's important, early stages of many insect groups, immature stages, they don't produce a lot of damage. They feed, they're relatively small, they don't consume a lot of plant material. As they become larger individuals, closer to pupation or turning into an adult, they consume a significantly, an exponentially large num amount of plant material. What that can make, do is create the appearance that the damage just happens overnight. All of the little damage, little damage, you don't necessarily notice, and then all of a sudden, massive amounts of damage. Okay, so yes, the picture is tongue in cheek. We were talking about superbugs, Superman, you know, you know, an insect in a Superman. Just forgive my sense of humor. Anyway, some pests can vector viruses. The really annoying ones will go into a crop, feed a tiny little amount, realize that they don't actually want to feed on that pest, on that host rather transmit a virus and then take off. So you don't even realize you have, you just have a transient insect moving into the nursery, spreading a virus and then moving on. Perhaps your surrounding environment is very conducive to certain types of pests, whether that be from a neighbor with weeds that has pests that are unmanaged or crop plants that are unmanaged or just natural environment and you're dealing, you're growing natives and all of a sudden you're getting pests into your crops. If you have pests that swarm, migrate, occur in plague proportions, that can be quite difficult. They may live in the soil growing media, they may live inside plant material, underneath the leaf sheaf, as for thrips and, and various other types of uh, uh, pests. You may not know anything about cultivar resistance. And again, native insects may not have a lot of information known. So who can relate to this sort of stuff? Who's, who's dealt with superbugs? Just um, raise your hand again, please. And um, if you haven't already, then type in some of the things that you have dealt with. And particularly if you have success stories that you'd like to share, that'd be great. And we can, we can pass those on. Okay. So that's the sort of, um, yeah, we had a few people raise their hand saying they're dealing with those pests. That's great, thank you. Um, I'm just going to uh, lower hands. The general approach for dealing with these types of pests, given that we're dealing with so many organisms, we are being a little bit general. We are asking questions to be able uh, to empower you to make your own plan. So you need to get information on the pest biology to generate a plan for your business. And even if another business has the same pest, it's likely that they'll be doing slightly different things to you. Whether that be for climatic reasons, you grow other host plants, you have a different irrigation, you've got a different polytunnel, or there's so many different factors. Everyone's a little bit different. So what I'm trying to suggest is that you will need to become the expert for your host plant for that pest. 
In doing that, it's really valuable to record the information in a document. An electronic document is better because it's easier these days to back up your, your document and then when you have a nursery manager move, you know, change bit roles or you know, just unexpectedly leave, you've got a record of the information that things that work, things that don't work, and you don't have to remake the wheel. It's really important to realize that the things that we're describing here are not the things that you would do for every single pest. You've got to decide when these actions are an appropriate use of your time. Is it worth investing the time and resources into developing these management strategies for a pest for a crop line. If you have, if you're only producing a small amount of that crop line, you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? Am I spending so much time on this one little pest that's very problematic, and destroying that crop line, when really it's only a very small amount of your overall business. So I can't answer that question for you. That is something that you will need to assess on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, so we'll keep going if I can get this, there we are. So as I said, we've got to look at the biology of these things. How do they get into the nursery? In what season are they active? What stages are they active in each season? Rather, what, uh, what stages are present and moving around feeding in each season in your nursery? Where are they laying eggs? Where do the immature stages feed? Where are they ha um, do they move from, let's say, the leaf into the growing tip? Where do they pupate? Is it on the plant or is it off the plant? Is it inside the plant? And then do they emerge through an exit hole? Do they overwinter or over summer? And if so, where? Similar to where they pupate? Is it on the plant, off the plant, in the growing area? These things are important to establish where they're going so you can do better to break the life cycle of the pest. Do certain... Um, do certain stages of your pest spend time off the plant? Do they migrate? Do they mate off the plant? Do they pupate off the plant? Do they rest off the plant? Certain groups will actually uh, um, lay eggs on buildings. So who's, who's seen army worms and, and things to lay their egg batches underneath the eaves? Um, just You can raise your hand. Um, or seen insects, a few people, thank you, I've seen, let's say, scarab beetle larvae, they, they congregate on posts or on buildings. There are all sorts of different life, life um, the biologies that can be very diverse. And you've got to ask yourself, well, what are the stages that I can exploit to stop the insect from becoming a pest on your plant, on your crop? What host plants are susceptible? And what are the climatic conditions that are make it make that pest? Uh, what are the conditions that are favourable or unfavourable for that pest? And really, here what we're getting at is this pest triangle. Um, raise your hand if you've seen this uh, this pest triangle where you've got your host that might be susceptible. You've got environmental conditions that may or may not be uh, favourable and you've got your pest. And we're all three of these things. Thank you, there are more and more people um, raising their hand, um, but some people haven't, so we'll just go into it a little detail. So where you've got your susceptible host and your favorable environment and the pest is present, you're more likely to have um, a higher incidence and or severe infestation causing damage by that pest. So if you remove the host, you don't have a problem. If you change the environmental conditions, you tend not to have a problem. Or if you exclude the pest, again, you don't have a problem. So you're doc talking about manipulating your conditions, your, your, your business to stop the problem. And again, there are other questions like how many generations 
occur per year. We've touched on this, but when are they active? Certain pest species can be present only in summer, let's say, and they might have three generations. And each generation, they'll increase in numbers. And so knowing these sorts of biological activity patterns will help you manage your problem. Um, this is an interesting question. How large is the insect? Because this will affect potential methods to exclude that insect from your growing area. And we'll talk about that more later. Okay, so where information is available on pesticide efficacy, then you can potentially use that information. And I know we said in the title when insects that aren't manageable by with insecticides or managing it without insecticides. However, they are still potentially useful tools. And if you use them the correct way, can have minimal impact. So one aspect where pesticides can appear to have no effect is when you've applied your product at the wrong time, at a stage where the pest is not susceptible. So as we've indicated earlier, small insects, they don't feed, uh, they don't consume as much foliage, as much plant material. They are also the more susceptible stages to pesticides. So you need to find out when is my pest at the smallest stage that I can detect? Can I apply my pesticide just prior to egg laying, the egg laying period? Or can I apply it just as eggs are about to hatch? Because as you'll find different pests, they'll lay their eggs at different times of the year, perhaps they overwinter. So it's important to know when the earliest stage is gonna become active in your crop. And have, if you're going to use pesticides, apply at the first stage of when they're going to be active in the crop. For borers and galling species, you really need to understand the mode of action of the pesticide. You've got to use systemic products. If you put on a contact product, you're unlikely to have a good, uh, effective um, kill rate. You're probably not going to manage the product, except perhaps if you're using the product as a deterrent so that they don't lay eggs on your plant. Likewise, for plants, that uh, for pests where they are underneath the leaf sheath or on inside a leaf mine or in a gall where the, the leaves are curled, you've got to apply products that are also either systemic or translaminar. Um, who, who does not know what translaminar means? Just raise your hand if you do not understand what translaminar means. Yep, a few people have raised their hand, thank you. So translamina are products that move from, let's say, the top of the leaf to the bottom of the leaf, or from the bottom of the leaf to the top of the leaf, but they don't move from one leaf to a different leaf. So that's basically a form of very limited systemicity. And the for many pest groups, we have described uh, or, or, or listed the pesticides that are available for use against that group or certain species within that group and whether they are systemic or, or translaminar or contact. And those fact sheets and pest management plans can be found on the Nursery Production FMS website. I'll be sending out a link to um, these fact sheets and pest management plans um, after the webinar. Likewise, contact products, they can be helpful to protect plants against chewing pests, where they may come along, chew on the product, and consume it, and, um, and then die. So it is helpful to understand how the pesticide is working and how, it will encounter, how the pest will encounter that product. Make sure that it all lines up, otherwise you're throwing away um, time and product. In, in the application, plus the cost of the product, which is becoming ever increasing. Okay, 
This is a massive point, and I know we've talked about host susceptibility and tolerance. This is one of the most important methods to culturally manage a pest. If you have a, a, a pest that doesn't damage certain cultivars, see if you can use those more, reduce the number of plants that you grow that are susceptible to a pest. I mean, who, who does this on a standard basis? They evaluate, they're growing a new crop line and just raise your hand. You're growing a new crop line, it's looking like it's gonna be great, but all of a sudden it's massively attacked by various pests and yeah, a few people raising their hands. Sometimes it's just not worth growing that. Okay, a few more going up, great, thank you. So when you're evaluating, is it worth it? See if, if you have at your disposal methods to exclude your pest, that may be an option. And I know it's, this is you know, a quarantine area, but really it's a sign. So you, you can put plants into a growing area in a polytunnel, and sometimes that can reduce your pest pressure just by having it in an, an enclosed space and keeping the door closed. Just raise your hand if you have experienced this sort of thing where you've just grown it in a polytunnel. It's not even insect proof per se, but it has reduced the pest pressure. Um, we've got at least one, two hands have gone up, uh, three, a few more have gone up just by putting it in a polytunnel. Awesome. If you wouldn't mind, can you write in in the um, in the comments the types of pests that you've reduced from sticking it in a polytunnel? Um, that would be awesome. Thank you. I'm just going to lower hands. Andrew. Yes. It, um, we did have one comment from uh, Colin Hunt, who actually said that um, he did stop growing a line of plants due to thrip issues um excellent good job only a small line but at least it's a yep. indicator that yeah, it's doing the right sort of thing perfect yep absolutely thanks colin um okay so for very small insects growing in enclosed structures and in insect proof can uh, polytunnels and structures can be quite difficult because you've got to have mesh that can reduce your uh, airflow, it can cause other issues. However, it's still potentially worthwhile in certain instances, but it is worth just investigating your ventilation system when you are considering producing or retrofitting a tunnel to be insect proof. Okay, so find out when is the pest infesting your stock? And this can involve some small scale trials. And the same with your pesticides, you can run small scale trials applying a pesticide to a product and not to some of the product and compare has it had an impact. That can be an awesome method for you to understand efficacy of that product. Likewise, when is the pest moving into your crop. You can purchase small cages, grow your plants in the cage to exclude that pest and have other, other hosts of the same line next to the cage outside, so open to potential infestation to try and disentangle how it's getting onto your plant. Is it coming from your, in, your incoming stock? Perhaps, you want to have more evidence that your supplier is, or have more confidence that a supplier is sending you stock with that pest. And you may want to stick it into a cage so that it is effectively not in contact with the rest of your stock to get an idea of where it's coming from. This point here on ensuring your mother stock is free of the pest. This can be more difficult than it sounds. I can say that, and it's really important, and particularly for certain groups of pests, very small pests where you can take a cutting, have almost no damage, or just have it be very cryptic, 
you can potentially propagate your pest as well as your plant and create a bigger problem down the track. And we'll talk about that more um, down, later in the webinar. Are they attracted to sticky traps? This is important. You can, particularly if you, are, if you have staff that can look at your sticky traps, monitor your sticky traps for that pest. Sticky traps are a monitoring tool. So if you're not monitoring your sticky traps, your small sticky traps, it's probably not much point in having them out there. I don't recommend feel good exercises and sticky traps, small sticky traps that are used for monitoring where you're not monitoring them is a feel good exercise. Don't waste your money. Mass trapping of sticky traps for let's say thrips and fungus net adults and things like that, sometimes that's helpful, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about sticky traps to monitor for a pest, make sure you use them. Okay, we've already talked about insect proof. Um, and rearing out pests. So this last point is growing the plant outside the season that the pest pressure is high. So if you know that your pest pressure is high during summer, can you change your growing system so that you produce it and sell it before summer hits? And just raise your hand if, if you have done that for certain plant systems. Um, there we, we've got at least one, two, a few, uh, at least two people. Excellent. A three, awesome. Hopefully that has worked very well and can alleviate your pest problem. Because really the best methods to manage your pest is to not have the pest at all. Okay. Record the conditions that lead to high and low damage. So what we're talking about is linking your climatic conditions, perhaps your fertilizer conditions. If, if you have a situation where um, you have lots of very soft new growth, did that plant get hammered? Did you have warm, wet conditions? And is that consistently leading to a higher amount of damage? then you can potentially use that information to manipulate your growing uh, area. So uh, we sometimes go to nurseries where you can see they have um, the ability to modify light levels, mod modify humidity, modify the day length, modify temperature. And depending on your irrigation system, if you know that warm, wet conditions are leading to favorable conditions, well, perhaps you can manipulate it to drier conditions in your protected cropping structure. This is a, hopefully a no-brainer. Remove alternative host plants and other areas that might provide resting areas. Now, it is concerning, however, when we go to nurseries and we see man weeds are growing in the potentially, oftentimes in non-cropping areas, obviously weeds in other, like outside your growing area on other people's properties, that's quite difficult. And we did re recently do a webinar and have other resources available for weeds. Weeds can be quite a, a problem, though there are some that like certain plants um, because they will also house predators. But in my view, weeds in nursery are bad. You want to get rid of them. So remove old stock. Old stock, you're more likely to have your insects move from your old stock that are damaged, maybe unsaleable, to your new crop. It's very important to remove that old stock and to remove it hygienically. If you know you've had pests on a plant, I would not recommend putting that plant onto a compost heap because insects move. Diseases, pathogens will move as well. And it is quite concerning when you see these throw out heaps with, that are loaded up with, with pests. So put them into a covered bin or put them in bags, have them um, disposed off site. So you stop the life cycle. 
consider growing alternative plants. We've already talked that about this. What I will say is keep your growing areas clean. So we're talking about breaking the life cycle of that pest after a crop cycle, remove, make sure that you clean it and have a system that is easy to be clean, have it be cleaned. And if you know that you've just dealt with a pest that has part of the life cycle, let's say in the gravel or in the soil that might be nearby, consider a method to disinfest that um, that that soil. Another option that I have heard some growers use is contracting out to a third party in a different climatic condition to grow the plants. Some nurseries have multiple sites in different states, and then you can modify who grows what depending on the climatic conditions. The bottom line here is to grow and sell plants that you can grow well. And hopefully some of these questions that we've talked about will help you to be able to grow more plants well and to run some tests to get to that point. And I know there's been a lot of information there. So we've got, oh, I, I forgot to put in a question time slide, but we've got a time for questions. John. Um, <clears throat> okay, there are, there's amazing the number of um, questions and responses we've had with this webinar, Thanks. Andrew. It's um, obviously a hot topic. Um, <clears throat> we've done thrips. Um, some issues with polytunnels. Um, we've had uh, white fly reduced by using polytunnels so with common areas uh, and, yes. and, and thrips also. Um, and again, another one from Colin, which was interesting. Uh, not so much pest exclusion. Uh, we used it to reduce bee visitations and mm. uh, using it for breeding purposes. So Excellent. that's another good issue with regards to using the quarantine polytunnel or any kind of polytunnel for that matter. Um, Excellent. Again, snails and slugs uh, from Todd uh, in quarantine tunnels um, and he's putting it okay. down to perhaps irrigation and the deep, the thickness of his aggregate being 20 mils. Um, okay. Thinking it might have helped reduce mm, um, okay. his snarls and slug. Um, okay. And again, we've got that monitoring option for leaf beetles. Leaf beetles, okay. Yes. Um, okay, all right. That. Um, okay, so thank you. So just looking back over those commenting, exclusion for white flies, there's some of those swarming insects. We're going to talk about them more uh, later. Uh, leaf beetle monitoring. So we actually do have a fact sheet for leaf beetles. What I'd recommend is learning how uh, to, I mean, it sounds terrible, but learn how to beat your plants. Um, who knows what I mean by plant beating? Just raise your hand. Uh, a cup one and two going up. So basically you need to have a, a single, like a white card or laminated um, card and you can take your foliage and whack it against the card and things that can fall off the plant tend to do so. And, and this can be a very efficient method to find a wide range of insects both predators and pests, including leaf beetles. So I'd recommend uh, having a look at the leaf beetle fact sheet. Okay, a few people raise their hand when I talk about plant beating, that's great, it's not just me. Um, okay. Um, also, um, uh, thrips monitoring, so I guess from the same person. Um, thrips monitoring, back, plant yeah, beating, They're talking yeah. about using blue sticky traps. Yes. Um, I know okay. there are different colours for um, different thrips. So there was some research done in WA uh, some years ago that looked at different coloured sticky traps, and they found that yellow sticky traps in the areas that they tested were the best at catching more pests, the most pests, and the and the least amount of predators. So. Just throwing that out there. Okay, um, so in I the interest do, of... I do recall Western flower thrip 
sticky traps for white, for, um, mm. I think for interstate quarantine issues. So, um, Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay, thank you everyone. We're gonna, in the interest of time, we're gonna move on to the next section, which is looking at some more specific examples. And really we are talking only about a small number and I tried to choose some that are, have a, a width and breadth, but again, within each of these groups, we're going to hear some repetition of the types of things that we're looking for. But hopefully these examples are helpful to stimulate your brain and be able to improve your management. Okay, so for borers and galling pests, tip boring pests, stem boring pests, <clears throat> the early stages produce the least amount of damage. So what you need to do is find a way of detecting early stage damage and be proactive. So for some pests, let's say Callistamine tip borer, if you can recognize when it's been hit early or um, it, then perhaps you can remove that tip and reduce your um, pest problem down the track. If that is too laborious, then you wanna be looking at other things to exclude the pest or grow it outside of your egg laying period. There are some products, these are new, relatively new uh, insecticide permits for the uh, production nursery industry. Most of them are for non-food nursery crops. Uh, cyan tranilaprol is a systemic product, same with all of these Prol products, and they can be quite, they're potentially worth trialing at your nursery if you have these sorts of problems on a regular basis. Keep in mind that some of them, like this one here, is combined with thiamethoxam, which is a neonicotinoid, and therefore you may have problems if you are selling to certain retailers. The, again, the most important thing, oops, I didn't mean to go is to grow alternative or resistant lines and yes. remove the old stock that could be increasing the inoculum load. If you've got stock like this in your crop, you may have larvae ready and waiting to pupate and, re re and grow out, mm. emerge as adults to fly to the next bit of crop. Also consider the growing environment that you are in. Do you have colistamins around like large trees in the non-cropping areas or in adjacent properties. Those sorts of things may increase the inoculum load in, in the area and then increase your problems. So consider those things, whether you can manage your non-cropping areas to have fewer problems in your cropping areas. Uh, selective, I think those are the salient points. For this one, I'm going to hand over to John because he's done a lot of work with leaf miners. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, can everyone hear me? Hopefully. Um, you can, can hear me, you. Andrew, can't you? Yeah, excellent. Yeah. So yeah. everyone else should. Um, yeah. I've actually been part of a nationally based leaf miner project on Serpentine Leaf Miner. So I'm still learning. I have learned a heck of a lot about leaf miners in the last 12 months. Um, but some of the issues with leaf miners per se, um, it's not just the physical mine that you have issues with, it's the feeding damage or the feeding sites and the egg laying sites that the fly actually causes on the actual plant. The small white dots you see on those images are actually where the fly will puncture the leaf and feed on the juices that come out of the leaf. And occasionally they will lay an egg inside uh, the, one of those lesions as well. So it's not just a mine that you see at the bottom on that um, spinach leaf there. Um, it's the actual physical damage they cause when they puncture the leaf that is a problem. They tunnel inside the leaf, depending on the thickness of the leaf, it might be on the top or the bottom. There are some hosts that are more susceptible or more severely damaged than others. There are a lot of leaf miners in Australia. We've just got three new exotic ones 
come into Australia over the past five or so years, two within the last 12 months. There are native ones in Australia that cause some damage, but they're really not an issue. They can pupate either in the ground, on the plant, or inside the leaf itself. Uh, and a lot of them, especially the exotic ones, are being are very tolerant to a whole range of pesticides. They come in with that tolerance. Growers see leaf miners, an outbreak in the crop that had never seen it before, and they start throwing whatever chemical they can at it. And that's usually the worst thing that you can do. It can be possible to grow alternatives depending on the tolerance or resistant lines that might be available and depending on the leaf miner you're actually dealing with. But the most important thing is promoting natural enemies. So don't reach for a pesticide off the top shelf to try and control your problem. We have well over 50 small parasitoids that actually attack leaf miners. We have in Australia, there are at least 18 different leaf miners. Um, I'm, not, I'm only actually talking about fly leaf miners. There are other leaf miners as well. Um, lip, oh, butterfly or lepidopteran leaf miners, be, beetle leaf miners. But I'm just talking about fly ones at the moment. Excluding the pest um, or grow outside, um, it can be difficult. These critters are very small, probably two millimetres in size. They can find a way into an enclosed area quite readily. Removing old stock, uh, Andrew has mentioned that with other, with the tip borers and other insects, these flies or leaf miners can overwinter and over summer. Some prefer hotter conditions, some prefer cooler conditions. You can use, a, there are a couple of permitted pesticides that are available for use in nursery stocks. As Andrew mentioned, they're more likely for your non-food type crops. They do have some translaminar activity but the more pesticides you use, the more damage you're going to cause to the biological um, the beneficial insects out there and the more damage you're actually then going to see. So the trick is not to reach for a pesticide. Let nature take its course. There are, like I said, over 50 different parasitoids out there. Nice. And even with these permits, you might need to still test how, whether they're safe on various crops that you actually got issues with. So test efficacy um, and just see how well they work. So. Excellent. All right, so just in the interest of time, we're gonna whip through these last ones and realize that we are going over time. So scarab beetle larvae feed on the roots. Sometimes adults can cause stem damage. Again, the large larvae cause a huge amount of damage, young larvae don't. So what you need to know, what, what you need to find is a method to, to monitor for second instar larvae. And I say that because second instars are relatively large compared to when they've just first hatched, but they still don't feed as much as third instars, which consume a huge amount. If you're dealing with scarab beetle larvae in your growing media on a regular basis, definitely investigate the use of entomopathogenic nematodes. But it's, and if you're going to use pesticides, make sure you only do so against first and second instar larvae because third instars are very tolerant towards pesticides. Uh, so in the interest of time, there is a fact sheet on scarab beetle larvae if you um, want to have more information Again, we've talked a little about scarab beetle larvae uh, life cycles. Understand the life cycle when they're present to pinpoint or to, uh, to recognize your high risk periods to, uh, so your monitoring can be more effective. Okay, a lot of people have scale insect problems. 
sometimes you see problems and it looks like this. I'd like to propose to you that if you have problems to this extent, you've missed the boat and you need to do something at a much earlier stage. If you're dealing with one species on a regular basis, it's definitely work, worth working out what species they are, so you have a knowledge of the alternative hosts and whether or not commercially biocontrol ag commercial biocontrol agents are available. Scale insects tend to slow down during cooler months, though in Northern Australia, that may not apply. Um, but in, in cool climates, they tend not to do, they're not as fast in their generations and whatnot. They tend not to be as active in cooler months. They tend to start becoming active in spring when it gets warm. And early on in late winter and early spring, that's when you need to be focusing on your scale insect management so that they don't become a problem later on through summer. So monitoring is critical and particularly monitoring of your mother stock. If you are taking cuttings and you have one scale in a cutting, you could be causing a massive problem down the track. So you may decide and may find, maybe someone has done this, developed a, a quality assurance process to examine your mother stock cuttings and determine if there is a low level of scale insects in your mother stock cuttings. Has anyone, has anyone done that sort of thing? There, we've got one hand raised. I'd be interested to couple more um, to hear your experience like of that. If you can quickly type it in, how big a difference did that quality assurance process make for you? And we do have a scale insect management plan that has a number of different products, some of which are not some of which are systemic and not neonicotinoids. So keep that in mind, have a look at that uh, for more information. We're gonna move on, swarming pests. You know we've had a couple of people say they've had white fly swarms come in, I've experienced others say they have beetles come in, and with the white flies, I've heard them say, and been there and seen the, the yellow uh, high-vis vest just becoming covered in white flies. Massive problem where they're just flying in droves in the air, There's, and uh, what I heard earlier on is that there was a massive reduction just by having polytunnels, having them in the polytunnels, keeping your doors closed. And from what I remember of um, my experience of that nursery, I seem to recall that they were looking at spreading their polytunnels. They were testing the use of polytunnels in a smaller area, and they went, yeah, that was working great. And so they just went did more and more, uh, more and more polytunnels. Can you just can Firm that for me. I don't want to put words in your mouth, mouth um, uh, Ashley. Uh, okay, so identify the highly susceptible plant species. If, and you can use those as uh, sentinel plants. So if you know that you've got a particular plant, you can sort of just grow them practically as a sacrifice to save the rest. They're, if the swarms are present, they're going to be present. And you can look and you can pinpoint and basically focus your monitoring so you don't have to do as much. Okay, and, the, and potentially, if you're dealing with a swarm, then once they're on your plants and you've got a massive amount, biocontrol can struggle to, to deal with those influxes and so you're going to need to test effect efficacy of knockdown pesticides. Okay, so that is our webinar for today. Sorry, we've gone a little over time.